Welcome to the Mind of Business Success Podcast. I'm your host, Alicia Kramer. Our guest today is Micah J. Kessel. We're going to talk about getting empathic. I think this is going to be a really, really fantastic conversation. We're going to go into a little bit about the change that needs to occur in businesses. And I love I love this guy's energy. I love what he stands for. Welcome to the show, Micah. Thank you, Alicia. It's such a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate it. So now you are, you're going to tell us about Empathable. And I think that's a really great place to start because it puts things into perspective and it builds the context for the somewhat uh, etheric introduction I made. (laughs) (laughs) So can you start by telling us about what you guys are doing, what you've created and what the real intention is behind it? Absolutely. Yeah. So empathable is a way of being, I would say, right. You could call yourself an empathable person. um, If you're able to find the the space within you to to be open to other people's perspectives knowing that they might not be your own but they're equally valid as individuals right it's interesting having the name empathy in our in the name of our organization because i actually think empathy is defined wrong in the dictionary um we define empathy often as the ability to understand um how someone else feels when the truth is we'll never understand how someone else feels, we, we barely understand how we feel half the time, um, right? We can never truly, truly walk in anyone else's shoes. But what if we redefined empathy as the ability to celebrate the validity of each other's experiences, as valid as our own? As in, if I can bring in an awareness that you, Alicia, right now are a human being that is having an equally intricate, delicate, passionate, multimodal, (laughs) um, multitasked experience of life as I am at this very moment, what does that do in terms of how I approach our collaboration? And since work is essentially about teams and building strong teams together and building, you know, teams of trust and teams of care and teams that can really build a generative culture, um, what if this new definition of empathy could create that for us? I think, so what Empathable is doing is creating immersive learning experiences that allow you to open your mind up to a pluralism of different experiences. We know that the best way to change your viewpoints within diversity, equity, and inclusion um, and belonging are to have this plurality of experiences, right? It's that friend in high school or that roommate in college, it's someone that you have a deep relationship with that's different from you that makes it really, really easy to embrace ideas from the other people that are identify similar, identifying more similarly to them, right? So that's how we lose our biases and that's how we come together. We don't do it through bullet points or statistics, right? We do it through exposure to real, real difference. And what Empathable is doing is creating that exposure to real difference through these immersive learning vignettes, which are enactments of real moments in real people's lives. And we're doing that through facilitated trainings that you can go through on Zoom, right, or in a virtual platform. And we're also doing it on an app so you can do a little bit every day. So I have to say that I absolutely love this because it's it's unique, it's innovative, but it really gets to the core of our own growth as individuals. And I have felt for a very, very long time that we need to bring more consciousness into business. The old model is kind of gross. And the way that human beings treat one another and the way that it's become acceptable to treat people uh, over the many, many years is not right. And we can feel it inherently within our beings. People are much more acutely aware of it when they're on the receiving end of someone's bias Mm -hmm. or someone is treating them inappropriately or unfairly because they don't have that, not just empathy, but even just that level of consciousness to, I recognize 
they're a human being. They have feelings, yeah. right? They're a mom or a dad or a husband or a wife or a, uh, you know, a person that has goals and dreams and aspirations and strengths and weaknesses. So now when you're working with these large companies, large organizations, and you're bringing this to them, I'm really quite curious how you're perceiving these larger companies really are they embracing this do they do they see the value in this or is it still sort of in its infancy where there's a little bit of resistance and pushback yeah so i love that question and i, I really want to comment on on what you just said too I, and i think i can do both at once <laughs> um so the way we think about learning by and large in in organizations is highly conceptual and it's not only conceptual in the space of diversity and inclusion it's conceptual in any type of learning for example i can tell you that you know i was at an inclusive leadership i was giving an inclusive leadership training for meta um, last week in new york city and other agencies were there and other organizations and we talked about how we were moving from a paradigm we want to be moving from a paradigm of command and control right this hierarchical pattern paradigm of leadership of command and control to one that is like an inverse pyramid of collaborate right and include how do we include each other how do we collaborate together how does the leader see themselves not as the person at the top commanding everyone from top down but really at the bottom of the inverted pyramid how am i there as a leader to support my team, to help you do the best job that you can do and tap into your intrinsic motivation and all these things, right? So that's great. It's great that we're having that conversation. A lot of organizations are having that conversation, but I have to say it remains a highly conceptual conversation. And a great example of that is if you look at, you know, people who are investing in, you know, venture capital, for example, if you look at investors that invest in women-led businesses, is it the ones that are given the most lectures or seeing the most statistics and data about the success of women-led businesses that are investing the most? No, it's the ones who have daughters, right? It is the investors that have a daughter themselves because they have that close contact and it makes them much more likely to invest in women. We need these points of exposure. We learn by experience. So even big concepts like how do we change culture as leaders of our organizations or as managers of teams needs to happen through experiential learning. And so how, how we're doing that is we're not telling anybody what to think. We're not even giving people concepts or statistics. We're simply saying, you know, for your next heritage month, right? We align with heritage months, for example. So for your next heritage month, um, we are going to invite you to walk in the shoes in February of a woman who works at a Fortune 50 company. She's a black woman with an MBA working as a project manager, right, within a Fortune 50. Or you could say Fortune 500. It happens to be a Fortune. Right, so this is a very ubiquitous role. Like there's many, many black women with MBAs working as project managers within companies. So most companies can relate to that. You don't have to know this specific individual. And by walking in this person's shoes as best as you can, right, because we never will completely be able to, but by doing it as best as we can, create that we through this immersive experience by seeing real moments in this person's life what happens is teams start talking right people see the experience and they start having conversations saying you know i've had that conversation about about touching hair before right or you know actually i've made that mistake and it took me a while to learn it but i'm you know i'm seeing this and it's making me think about that right so people are verbalizing their own epiphanies and discoveries and I think epiphany is the key word here mm. because I think that's how we learn. We learn by epiphanies and not a, epiphany does not happen when someone tells you to have it. <laughs> <laughs> An epiphany is something we create ourselves. So it's that epiphany that brings us into a process of learning where we, we end up teaching each other through these dialogues. Teams teach teams through the deeper conversations that we can have because we're seeing someone else's immersive experience. And this is, this is such an... It seems like a very small thing that I'm saying in a way because it's like, okay, cool. We watch some immersive films over the course of 60 or 75 minutes, right? Or we go through this app. We do a little bit every day. We come together almost like a book club and we talk about it. What's the big deal? Why would that change so much? But the change is huge. 
right? We're seeing double digit increases in teams ability to be empathic with each other and people thinking that they share the same ideals. So team alignment is going up, right? We're seeing that that's predicting impact of increased retention of team members in a time of the great resignation. We know that's super important, right? So people are feeling more trustworthy. They're trusting each other more. They're feeling more loyal to their organization. They're feeling more aligned in their goals, right? As a, as by, by nature of having these conversations, and the, the thing that we're fighting is not only concepts, but it's the way that legal falls into the way that we learn things, right? If from a legal perspective, an HR you know, program says never compliment anybody on their appearance at work, right? Never say anything about anybody's appearance at work ever. Cool. So you just asked me to not be a human being <laughs> and pretend like everyone I work with is basically an automaton and we have no relation, right? We have we have broken down our ability to actually build part of our relationship because I can't say to you, Alicia, I love that jacket, right? Context is life. Our life is context. We can't strip away all ability to compliment people, but we also have to be careful to not make compliments that are you know, abusive or insinuating other things, right? And legal can't handle that, right? Concepts can't handle that sort of context, but immersive learning can. We can't, through, through seeing other people's experiences and having conversations about them, we can learn about each other in a really effective way. So I think that's the- So good. So I just want to give you a standing ovation because I think it is amazing. There's something that you you talked about, and I just want to go back to it for a moment because I I really feel strongly that our listeners can get so much out of this. Now, obviously, there's a tremendous amount of evidence that this is really, really helpful within an organization. But from an individual's perspective, I really want to laser in on this because you gave some gold that even if even if they take nothing else out of this interview, but this piece, I think this is profound and powerful. And you said it so gracefully, so eloquently, it's so much already in your own own unconscious competence that you probably didn't even realize how profound it actually is. And that is this piece about immersive learning because a lot of people still have the frame of reference from, from how we're taught as children. You go to school, you recite your ABCs, your one, two, threes, everything is read in a textbook and lectured on. And our whole life, we're trying to learn conceptually. And as business owners, especially who are really committed to growing, to their own personal growth, to growing their businesses. They're trying to grow from this conceptual model, mm -hmm. learning, taking all the courses, you know, learning from all the gurus, listening even to the podcast, going through all of these motions. And there is a disconnect between what they're putting in and what they're actually integrating, what they're embodying, what becomes like this real integrated part of who they are and how they can actually implement that in their life and in their business. So we can know a lot of things, but the knowledge in and of itself doesn't necessarily translate to results. Mm -hmm. So when mm -hmm. you're talking about this immersive, experience this really is about those deeper level understandings that aha moment that you referenced it's so mm -hmm. powerful because anytime we have that aha moment we understand something at a deeper level it's no longer just conceptual it becomes a known and then yeah. it becomes a part of us yeah, it becomes a part of us as individuals, and then it also becomes a part of our teams, right? And that that's such a magical thing when that happens. Psychological safety is is such a such a loaded word, I think, because we know, you know, in, there was a 2016 study that Google made of what makes successful teams, and they looked at everything you could possibly look at. Was it, you know, higher education? Was it higher salary? Right? Was it introverts or extroverts on a team together? And they found out none of that made a difference. 
right? The most fundamental thing of, of a great team is psychological safety. And you can't have a psychological safety team that doesn't feel inclusive. But this word is also very triggering for people, I think, right? So sometimes it's nice to use the word trust as well, right? If we're just thinking about what trust is, I think psychological safety or trust comes down to well, many things, but there's one basic thing that I think it comes down to that's very hard, which is, do you feel safe? Do you feel okay, let's say, to ask a question that might be considered a stupid question or that might mean that someone thinks that you weren't listening 20 minutes ago and you checked out for five minutes and therefore this question is a reflection of the fact that you checked out? Can you do that or can you not do that? Because if we're not able to be curious about, you know, what we're doing on each other's teams, if we're not able to ask these important questions, how are we going to align, right? How are we going to share information laterally to help us achieve our goal as a team? It's it's going to be impossible. So why does experiential learning, why does immersive learning pay, play such a big impact on that? Because if you don't feel like you can ask those questions, a lot of times the reason is we just don't have that sense of knowing each other at a level that feels comfortable. There's a part of one of our experiences, um, a, a different person's experience. This one is of a woman who is a legal intern um, and she's, you know, in the beginning of this particular experience, we, we talk about items of clothing that have symbolic meaning for us. So a question we ask our, the people that we're doing the training with is, what is an item of clothing that has symbolic meaning in your life? Um, and I, I feel really tempted to want to ask you this question too, Alicia, because I, I love this question. So maybe we can talk about it in a second, but I'll, I'll get to the point first, which is we talk about items of clothing that have symbolic meaning. And then we talk about three words that describe the emotions that come up for like, what are the emotions that come up when we think about this item? And so for the person in this experience, so that the teams do it, right? We go around and we share and it's really beautiful. And it, it in-groups us all because we all wear clothing, right? The person sharing the experience talks about shea butter, right? And that as a black woman growing up in a Southern household, you know, she was always told by her grandmother never to leave the house looking ashy. And I can't tell you how many people through going through this experience have learned what being ashy means. And it seems like, okay, what does this have to do with work? Well, what just happened is we just shared a cultural connection with people across race, right? And across gender and across sexual orientation. Like we've all shared this collective conversation. And I feel like you know me better. When it comes to our meeting, like later on today at five o'clock on a Tuesday or whatever, where we're going to be talking about, you know, goals for next week, all of a sudden I feel much more safe asking that question that I wasn't going to ask. And if I hadn't asked that question, right, then probably three weeks from now, when we do a retrospective on this project and we realize we missed one really essential thing, like that thing wouldn't have been missed had I asked that question, right? So like it, it just comes down to this causality that at the root of it is based on how well do we feel like we know each other. Um, and Alicia, I do really want to ask you the item of clothing question if you're. <laughs> well, I'll tell you that my first thought was my Christmas pajamas. Really? Can you and tell then me where right on the heels of that, though, was my exercise shoes. Both Ooh. of them bring me so much joy. <laughs> Can you, you describe um, the the Christmas pajamas? So I have all types of Christmas pajamas. In fact, here's a little insight that'll bring everyone a little bit closer to me. I wear Christmas pajamas all year long. <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool. That is so, and what when you think about three words that describe for you, when you focus on Christmas pajamas and you think of three words that describe how they make you feel, what three words would you would you use to describe your feeling of Christmas pajamas? And before mm -hmm. you describe them, I want everyone who's listening to imagine three words that you think Alicia is going to say. Okay, go for it, Alicia. Okay, I will say joyful, mm -hmm. youthful, mm -hmm. and lighthearted. Mm, joyful, youthful, and lighthearted. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. So I'll share one too, but first I'll just say, 
I could have never predicted those three words, right? The three words in my head were not those three words. And it just goes to show, you know, emotions are not universal. And the way that we feel about things are, are not universal. And so taking time to hear your unique experience of life, like makes me feel so much closer to you. And I literally feel closer to you now than I did two minutes ago because of that sharing. Um, for me, an item of clothing that has significant meaning in my life is, I would say there's a yellow Levi's sweater. It's just like a sweatshirt. Um, but I have like the full, I have the sweatshirt and the sweatpants of it in the same color. So I have like a full on yellow Levi's sweat thing happening. Um, and I love wearing them together. Uh, and the reason is actually I was on Instagram once and I saw an Asian um, young woman who was advertising some sort of skin serum and she was wearing like a full on yellow outfit. And I realized in that moment that I was like, I would really like to have that too. And then the next thought I had is, wow, probably some of the reason for that is because I feel like there's representation happening that doesn't normally happen. I'm not used to seeing like an Asian woman who we have similar features, who's advertising the serum. And it's like, how, how interesting is that? It was similar when I was in Mexico City. I also noticed that there were a lot of men that I thought looked more like me. And I was like more interested in what they were wearing, you know? And so when I think about this sweatsuit, it makes me feel comforted. It makes me feel kind of at home. Um, and it makes me curious, it makes me feel curious about myself. Yeah. This is a beautiful exercise. And I think that a lot of people have created these walls around themselves. And when given an opportunity to sort of bring down some of these walls, it's liberating. Mm -hmm. It's it's beautiful to be able to express yourself to say, hey, I'm a little bit weird in this area, right? And and I love that aspect of myself. And when yeah. you get to be in other people's energy and they're having that same experience, it's really empowering. Like let's stop putting up all the facades and always wearing all of the armor. And let's just get back to being real. Remember when we were kids <laughs> and you would play with anyone and it was so fun. Little children, they don't judge anyone by their skin color, by their language, by their accent. There's just this just beautiful quality that mm. we all have sort of latent within us that so many people have covered up and repressed as a way to cope, to survive. Mm. And we need to get back to just being more of that authentic version of ourselves. And I just so love that you're bringing this into the corporate environment and you're helping to bring more of this beautiful human quality that we all have back into this part of our lives, right? Business is always going to be a part of our lives. Commerce is always going to be a part of our lives. It is what yeah. makes, makes us thrive and it does connect us all. And yet we've been doing it in such a disjointed, disconnected way for so long that people have forgotten that this is about serving one another, being of service to one another. That's why we're doing this, you know? Yeah. So I, I love this conversation. I love so much what you're yeah, doing. Yeah, me, me too. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, how much more willing and interested would you be to work together after the little exercise we did, right? Like how much more do we feel like, okay, we could, like I kind of know what collaboration would feel like a little bit more just from that those simple few minutes um did you feel that oh absolutely absolutely and i'm sure anyone listening can actually put themselves right in here in and be part of this like kind of a trifecta yeah. because there is a, a desire that we all have to feel like we belong to feel like we fit in to feel like there is harmony to feel 
loved and appreciated and approved of. It is just this inherent desire within all of us. Yeah. Yeah. So much. So I really love um, what you were saying about, you know, the way that children approach each other. One of our advisors, who's an L and D leader, um, learning and development leader, Nathan Knight was saying that, you know, his, his idea of a, a competent, competent, uh, competency model <laughs> is as simple as like work hard and be nice. And I love that. And then he said his idea of a cultural model is have fun conversations with interesting thoughts. And I thought that's really interesting too, because that's what children are doing, right? They're, they're creating thoughts that they find interesting and they're having fun conversations with them through play. Um, something that I realized just a few days ago, I was having a similar conversation to some degree as we are now. And it was about, you know, how do we create empathy in businesses and doing a lot of, you know, trainings and keynotes with, with leadership. A question that often comes up is, you know, but how is this possible? How can we do this? We have, I'm managing 20 people or I'm managing 150 people. It's not like I can ask every single one of them what an item of clothing is that has meaning to them and have these, you know, conversations. I can't even ask all of them, how are you, you know, on a regular basis. And then what I've, what I've learned in working with many different organizations from like really small nonprofits to really large, you know, 100,000 person companies is that team members need to know that their managers and leaders are inherently curious about them by nature, right? Like you need to know that you can come to me and say something to me and I'm probably gonna wanna hear it. Whether I'm too busy is, is a different story, but am I interested? Am I inherently interested in what you have to say? And that's something that can exude from the way that we interact with each other and the, the way that we structure, structure time with each other um, and the way that we structure listening. Uh, so I, I think, you know, even if you feel like it's hard to create, um, you know, a team or teams where everybody's having that personal time, creating structures where that personal time can can exist through, you know, a town hall where people give you questions the night before and you do it once a month. And that way you're answering people's questions that you have no direct contact with at your company. Right, but they know that you've asked for it the night before so that you can give a thoughtful answer and they feel addressed. Or having office hours as a team leader so that anyone can come in and schedule 10 minutes whether you directly manage them or not so that they can ask you questions. Like the value of those 10 minutes in a time that you have designated for yourself, 90 minutes a week, it, it's not even about whether they schedule it or not. It's about whether they know that you have offered the time to want to listen. That's powerful. That's, yeah, yeah. I knew this was going to be a great conversation. You did not disappoint. <laughs> so can sure. you share with our listeners how they can learn more about Empathable and any way that they can connect with you? Yeah, absolutely. So empathable.com is, is our website, you know, and it's spelled empathable, right? E-M-P-A-T-H-A-B-L-E.com. We have a great blog on that website, and you can certainly read about different approaches to change that based on our social science work, we've found successful, right? So we work with two labs um, and we we gain from their knowledge. One is a bias research lab at Harvard Psychology. And another one is an emotions research lab at Northeastern where I'm design lead. And um, we apply this social science knowledge to try and understand how we can be helping other DEI leaders and other LND and HR leaders um, lead their teams in a more effective way. So we really encourage you to sign up for our newsletter because we're never really asking you for anything. We're just giving you kind of the learning that we've gained and hoping that you can, you know, pay it forward and and help your teams by, by virtue of that knowledge. Um, and then the other one is go to our website and set up a demo so that you can see a little bit of our experience. And, you know, you can come to our webinar, we can share it there, or we can even share it one-on-one -on -one with your team so that you can see what that's like. Um, we really believe that aligning with heritage months is a great way to work with us because people at organizations will show up more if it's, you know, people will show up to an LGBTQ plus event um, during pride month with greater likelihood than they will in, you know, September. And so um, 
finding ways to align really immersive learning techniques and programs with heritage months is a really great way to get greater uh, engagement. So we, we like working with folks that way too. Awesome. Yeah. I want to thank you so much, Micah, for being with us today. It has been a pleasure discussing this topic with you. Yeah. Thank you, Alicia. It's really been a pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for your wonderful questions. And of course, I've got to thank all of our listeners. You know, we're doing this for you. If you haven't already subscribed, make sure you do so. And until next time, we will see you in the next episode.